Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the official Neo Tokyo podcast, Interlinked. We are powered by Shrapnel. Brace yourself for impact, crypto gamers. I am reporting from the Sacrifice Zone. STX3 just wrapped up, and it was chock full of new features. One of those new features is the addition of weapon skin fragments. Scattered all over the map, in drawers, in boxes, on your dead opponents, there were weapon skin fragments that you could extract and then combine to create new weapon skins and bring those to the marketplace or strap them onto your favorite weapon and hop back into the sacrifice zone. They also added Metal, their off-chain point reward system, and some killer map updates. I know I had a blast in STX3 and am already excited for STX4. Huge shout out to our sponsor, Playable Games. They are inspired by gamers and funded by their community. They have a epic game on the Epic Game Store, a third-person shooter called Nexus. Hop on in there and check that out. They're also currently selling nodes, so if you're interested, check that out at their website, playable.games. That is a three instead of a B on playable. Now strap in for the rest of this episode of Interlinked. Today, we are joined not only by my co-host, Jared, we're co-hosting it up today, uh, but also with Daryl, the co-founder and CTO of Creo Engine. How are we doing today, Hey, doing good, guys. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Fantastic to have you here. Uh, Let's kick things off with a personal introduction. Maybe touch on your Web 2 background, how you got into Web 3, and anything else you think the audience should know about you, Daryl. Yeah, sure, sure. First of all, you know, uh, Jared, Nick, thank you for having me, you know, especially allocating your time for me. I'm glad to be here in the podcast for New Tokyo. And, you know, uh, me personally, I'm nothing more than a, your average indie game developer, right? I grew up developing indie games. I have a passion for indie games. And, you know, ever since in college, I actually sold my car that my dad gave me, you know, and <laughs> it, it, it was pretty traumatic, but I sold my car to finish my first game. And, you know, uh, I didn't even finish the payments on that. So I had to <laughs> had to go through some hoops. <laughs> I was actually chasing uh, my first indie game, trying to get it done and really push it out there. Uh you know, as my first Magnus Opus, if you will, right? Like, basically, that's my first game, you know, coming out of the woodwork. And, you know, that game, well, frankly, despite my hard works, it didn't do well, right? Frankly, it it flopped, but, you know, I finished it. I finished it. I pulled through it. But what's funny is that, you know, ever since I finished that game, you know, you know, my dad, you know, he's a good guy. He's been helping me a lot in my journey, self-development and, you know, my schooling and everything. He told all his friends that, hey, my son's a game developer. Right. So about five, about five to six years ago, he was spreading word about my exploitations, my, you know, car selling incident, you know, and and his friend actually reached out to me and said, you know, your son actually makes indie games. Like, yeah, he does. And on that fateful day, August 2021, Right. I think it was yeah, August 2021. Uh, we actually established Creo Engine. Right. So the company actually came to be because, you know, during COVID, you know, my dad was having his morning coffee and he called his friend up and, you know, we, we, we did some talks. We actually talked over and he told me, make a pitch deck about how you could, you know, make a Web3 game and how this could be beneficial. So at the time, I was I wasn't really that smart. I actually. You know, I just, okay, it's a pitch deck, a business proposal, you know, how could you make money and all that? Oh, it's easy lemons. You know, it shouldn't be that hard to make a company like Creo Engine. And I was in (laughs) for a rude awakening because a company like this, it's incredibly hard to make. Frankly, becoming Indonesia's, you know, largest and most promising Web3 web gaming platform is no easy feat. You know, getting to know the right people, meeting the right people, getting the right developers on board, it's a pain. But the ultimate goal for our company is essentially how can we provide welfare through entertainment, right? Which is basically, you know, the whole approach, the whole thesis of my business, right? Especially for people who are unbanked, who do not have access to banking or financial services. And Indonesia being a country where gaming is well received. And by the way, Web2 games can actually be of good service financially to a lot of these people they can sell accounts sell cosmetics 
Why not do it through a secure means like the blockchain? Why not do it through special made games that are good for the blockchain? Introduce it at mass to Indonesia and potentially Southeast Asia. And, you know, I actually went in this endeavor thinking that we're going to be the first, right? And we are, we are the first in the country. But looking outside our competitors like WeMix and all these behemoths out there, it's actually a good business. You know, people flock, they play games and they actually trade assets and they make good money. I want to bring this project. I want to bring this kind of, you know, this kind of business model to people of Indonesia. And of course, our, you know, uh, neighbors like Singapore, Vietnam and India. Right. I want to make an easy to use platform. So we made a studio. You know, we made our first game because to make a platform, you got to make your own game because platforms that a game is it's practically useless. So. With my knowledge of indie games, I put myself to the test and I made my first studio called Nomina Games. And with that, we made Evermore Nights. And that game is today making people money. It's it's actually working. You know, you can check out at evermorenights.com if you want to try it out. You know, it's free to play on Google Play and on Creo Play. Give it a shot. <laughs> I'm just going to self-sell myself if that's fine. No, but essentially... You know, that's how it all began, right? My ex, my escapades, you know, selling my car, making indie games. And here I am right now, you know, running a gaming platform. And we're in the midst of, you know, doing a lot of deals with developers, government officials, trying to make this a big thing, or should I say making this a big thing in Indonesia and beyond. So that's just a bit about myself, if that helps. <laughs> No, that definitely helps. Uh, so many different interesting things that we're going to dive into throughout the, sure. the pod. Um, but for people, I know you mentioned a few of the things that you guys do at Creo Engine, but which one of those things is sponsored the podcast of which we are very, very grateful for. So definitely a big shout out for that. Um, but let's give the audience a good encompassing view of like, what is Creo Engine? I know you guys have the Creo Play. There's AI in there. There's real world assets. I oh, yeah. you know you guys do, you do a lot. So let's get a nice overview and then we sure. can dive into some of the specifics. No problem. So an overview for our listeners, right? Creo Play, or should I say Creo Engine, is making Web3 gaming easy. Our slogan is connecting worlds and our main mission is to democratize Web3 gaming for the common man, the common user. People sh shudder in terror, creating wallets, you know, gas fees, all these different chains, these games. They don't know where to start. You know, I, I asked my I asked my friend, you know, who's not a crypto native person, he said, oh, do you know Web3 gaming? Yeah, I do. I'd love to get into it, but I don't know how to do it. You know, I'm scared of all these gas fees, these MetaMask wallets, these hacks, you know, what's Bitcoin? What's, you know, it's a myriad of flavor when it comes to crypto. And, you know, we want to make it simple, right? To democratize Web3 Gaming is our main mission. And to make Web3 Gaming easy is our, well, our passion, right? To give people access to Web3 Gaming and to give people knowledge on Web3 Gaming and what Web3 Gaming really is. That's our mission, you know, to develop that and to really solidify it across our network, right? So for that, you know, Creo Engine is the name of the company. It's our it's our business. Of course, that company has a token called the Creo Engine token, or in short, Creo. Now, for that, we created a platform called Creo Play. Now, the purpose of that platform in general is to really just be the gaming aspect of the platform, right? You know, to really put all the games there and, you know, platforms, features, and, you know, uh, add-ons to really support individual games, creators, and the users who are interacting with those games. And this is nothing new. If you look at Steam, you know, Elixir, uh, Wemix, you know, those guys do it well. But, you know, we want to do it in a way where it's easier, more accessible, right? For that, you know, we've taken an initiative actually, Nick, to, for the past four months to actually create a wallet where people could just use their WhatsApp, their Gmails, and to just create an instantaneous wallet or an ID and people could easily just log into these Web3 games and start earning, right? And that's the first step to really getting our platform across. Now, a little side note, you're probably wondering, Daryl, why did you call yourself Creo Engine? You just call yourself Creo Play and just be done with it. You know, in terms of a branding sense, right? Why do we call ourselves an engine? <laughs> why not just stick to one thing called Creo Play? It's just easier to do that. And the answer is simple. It's just really a, a weird branding choice, but also a personal one for me personally. I called it Creo Engine because I want to be an engine for change, right? A system, a movement, 
a move forward, if you will, in the Web3 gaming space. So besides Creole Play, we have our DeFi's, we have our upcoming launch pads, right? We also have, you know, uh, Telegram games, Telegram systems, you know, to work with Telegram games. So it's all under one big banner, right? And we really want to show that the name engine doesn't is not just there for show. Right? We're not just there uh, to just slap it on there. Oh, we're an engine. No, we're more of a movement, right? And the word engine just sounds kind of cool. So, you know, I thought I'd just put that in there and say, hey, you know, we're an engine for change, right? Our little slogan. <laughs> so that's really an overview, right? A Web3 company democratizing it, you know, making it easy and accessible for a lot of people. And, you know, it's a lot of work, but guess what? You know, I'm happy to be here, happy to get it done. And, you know, I'm seeing a lot of progress being made. We have the best minds on board from reputable companies. We also acquired a AAA studio, you know, trying to make high quality games, making it accessible for Web3 users, the whole shebang. And, you know, I really want to show people that you can make a living. You can make a honest living. You could actually make business and do business in the Web3 gaming space. So why not go to us, a reliable platform, secure and easy to use? And that's our business. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um Let's dive into the rest of the team. So you mentioned you've got a killer team all working on this, um, including yourself. Who are the rest of the big team members who are bringing the Creo engine to life? No problem. You know, we got a guy, it's Javier, uh, the CEO of Creo Engine. He's a big finance guy, right? He he loves finance. In fact, the entire co-founding team is from one place called Madon. Now, Madon is a separate area from Jakarta, which I am from. And, you know, those guys are financial gurus are smart. You know, they know how to they actually really do, do, uh, dwell deep in, you know, Web2 finance, stocks, remittances, securities. These guys know it all with their experience and their knowledge in the financial industries. You know, a lot of the work and financial work goes to them. You know, I'm more of the product guy, the visionary, you know, trying to get things across them and, you know, see if it's feasible. Right. So Javier is a finance guy. We have Calvin. He's a community manager. Great guy. He's also our commissioner, right? But he has, he's been, he's an entrepreneur at large, right? A serial entrepreneur in Madon, has a lot of great connections. And he also dwells in the finance industry and the property industry. So a lot of strong, hard-hitting Web2 businesses, right, on our side. We also have Ghani, our CMO. He's worked at Grab. And Grab is a large, large company, food delivery company. And he actually responsible for actually, you know, spreading out grab across Madon. So he knows very well how to, you know, really get things going in the marketing sense. And then we have David. Now, David's a rock star. That guy, he, he's a heavy metal band artist. He loves the work. And he actually had his, he actually tried to get his band, you know, signed up with a big record label guy. He's, he's, he's a hard worker, honestly, with his dedication, his panache, his intelligence, you know, we could string a lot of things together. So, you know, shout out to my teams, you know, my co-founders. I'm happy to be with them, happy to be on the journey with them. And, you know, yeah, that's the co-founding side. As for our employees and our staff, you know, they have worked in pretty, pretty large gaming companies of the likes of Anantarupa, right? And they actually, the studio that we acquired in India, those guys have been working with for the past two months or so. They worked in games like Titanfall, you know, Assassin's Creed. These guys are hard hitters, unreal developers making AAA games. So, you know, this is an all-star team. And, you know, I'm in the, I'm in the center of it trying to make sure that what we do, the things we do, it all goes through, right? And me personally, Nick, right? I'm any game developer, but I know the importance of, you know, distribution, going to market because I studied accounting. I studied, you know, business administration and marketing, right? But I also helped my father out, you know, with his businesses in property, but also food and beverage. So, you know, that's just my background in a sense, right? I know very well the importance of, you know, going to market quickly and, you know, trying to get things across and iterate quickly, right? Which is really the whole point of me being here as a CTO is how to iterate fast you know, how to be fast, essentially. But yeah, that's just a brief info about, you know, our team, our cast, <laughs> if that helps. Yeah, absolutely. That definitely helps. Um, you know, obviously, Neo Tokyo, we're super focused on the gaming side. So I think that's a good place to deep dive first. Um, so as a platform, you had mentioned some of your competitors in the space. What are some of the things that really differentiate uh, the Creo platform from some of the other competitors in the space? You know, that's a great question, right? 
And I say that our unfair advantage is our slogan. You know, if you read our website, it's called Connecting Worlds, right? We want to create what we call dynamic NFTs, where a developer could essentially create digital collectibles that are viable in different games. If you have an NFT in your ID and that NFT could work in 10 different games by giving you intrinsic bonuses, could be, you know, increased attack, increased health, you know, depending on the game design. We want to create a platform where developers have the opportunity to cross collaborate with each other through these dynamic NFTs, which is really the whole thesis of how to make NFTs speculative. Because when that happens, people who are on our platform can trade NFTs for business because of what they do across different games instead of one game. Right. When that happens, then a lot of interesting things will happen because people from one game could have buyers from other games. And that kind of business is what we really want to jumpstart in our platform in general. Right. Which is the ultimate purpose of my of the business as, as, as a whole. Right. But another unfair advantage is really how acceptable and how viable we are in Indonesia. Right. We are the first gaming platform in Indonesia aiming to be a Web3 centric business. And we're actually legalized by the government. You know, our tokens legalized by the government and the government is, you know, really breathing down my neck. Tell me, Daryl, you got to really perform. You got to do something, Daryl. You know, <laughs> you got to make it work. And here I am trying to make it work, trying to make it happen. And, you know, right now, just just as a little tidbit, a little spillage, right? We're going to do a big campaign this quarter, getting 100,000 active users on our platform to try out our products and our systems, right? Which will really be a big push for our business in general. But yeah, those two if you could say that those are our advantages, but now that we've acquired AAA student, perhaps that's also another advantage where we could actually mass produce, you know, high quality games with good fidelity on our platform and really create business. Right. And of course, you know, another advantage is that now you can use your WhatsApp to create your wallet, which practically all of Indonesia does use WhatsApp. I think there's about 80 million people using WhatsApp and they're all gamers at heart. So, you know, that's a big blue ocean market we could tap into and be your first mover in. So, you know, big things happening. And, you know, look at my eyes, you know, I have big eye bags. I'm really lacking sleep, but, you know, I got work to do. <laughs> that's my that's my calling. So I got I got to do I got pushed for the stars, if you know what I mean. Oh, eye bags are an essential part They're of Web3. Essential. I've got them myself. I wake up <laughs> with them all the time. I think it's exactly. like not only lack of sleep, but I, there's something about Web3 that I think makes you a restless sleeper. I'm tossing and turning. Oh, I'm dude. waking up in the middle of the night thinking about random coins. Dude, I know how you feel, man. I feel that I feel the same way too, honestly, every day. Uh, but, you know, you get used to it, right? The adrenaline, the joy, right? It's, yeah, we can, get a little, we can get a little sleep during the next bear. Oh, yeah. We're going to hibernate like bears, huh? <laughs> That's the end exactly. of the game. You got to like stay awake, stay alert. You're a bully and you got charged, right? <laughs> Ain't that the truth? That's the well, truth, buddy. Well, I definitely want to deep dive the government uh, relationship that you guys have. But first, to sort of finish up on the gaming side or to dive deeper on the gaming side, you just mentioned acquiring a studio. I know you guys have Evermore Nights and Slime Haven that are either in production or obviously uh, Evermore Nights is already out on the Google Play Store. So I'd love to know just the general strategy around bringing games onto the Creo Engine platform. Is it going to be a hybrid developing in-house and acquisition? I know you guys were talking about the launch pad, so I got to imagine that'll fit into the general strategy. Uh, but if you could dive into that for us. That'd sure. Be cool. So it's really a multifaceted thing. And the answer is a hybrid. Let me tell you why. I could develop high quality games that are integrated fully into the platform and set an example for other developers, right? I could develop a AAA game and garner users to use it through my platform. And the AAA game in question is a very nice game. Check it out. It's called Animera.World. Fantastic game by Striker Games, which we acquired. And I actually am the CEO of that studio. Fantastic team. And, you know, we're trying to make sure that when we put games in a platform that are actually fun games, right? And you have to understand the importance of how beneficial fun games are because they aggregate users. So Creo Play as a platform is not a launcher. No, it's actually an aggregator, right? We want to aggregate games and bring games on board and bring users on board. And if we have a lot of users to begin with, then it'll be easy for me and my business development team to actually leverage those to attract developers, because like it or not, we want to be a value add for developers and, of course, users. But of course, to have a lot of users, you must have good 
game. So you know, the chicken egg problem is easily solved. OK, I could either buy a game, buy a studio or make my own game. Frankly, since we bootstrapped to make Creo, we have to make our own game. It's cheaper. And frankly, I have more control over it. So when that game's done and it's working, it's a case study. I then could attract, you know, not just developers, but potential users who are keen on making, you know, on, on making income from these games. And better yet, now most of our games are trying to really adopt the win to earn perspectives where the tokens are deflationary because they're win to earn. Right. So we want to make games that are not just fun, but when people play it, they theory craft it, which is, by the way, theory crafting is a major, major thing for CAC or for CLV. If you for any game, you know, CAC basically means customer acquisition costs versus customer lifetime value. Your goal is to increase your CLV over your CAC. And you must have a lot of theory crafting. Genshin Impact, artifacts, you know, you have World of Warcraft, armor sets. You have to have games that allow people to theory craft. So this is why my first game took me a long time to make because I want to make sure people, when people play it, they spend hours just figuring out what to build, right? And that is the joy of gaming. You know, you have esports, which are pretty straightforward, but then you have RPGs, which are pretty hardcore and they take hours every time. So users will stay on a platform longer with theory crafting. And now developers can see all that traction and they'll be like, great, I'd love to join Creative Play. I'd love to put my game on your platform. And when that happens, there'll be a snowball because now their community is coming. We're going to assimilate users and we're going to just really go out of control here and become a massive conglomerate of users and data, right? So that's our strategy as a platform. We want to really be a value add for developers quickly. But here's the, here's the other catch, which I forgot to mention in my previous question. And the previous question was this. We also want to onboard single player games, right? So users or developers that are making single player titles, you can now use our DeFi tools to create digital collectibles. And what's going to happen? Great. Those collectibles can be useful in multiplayer games. What's going to happen? You have more customers buying your single player titled games. So we want to make Web3 gaming not just online, but also offline. We want to show the importance of how you can use Web3 as a business avenue for your product as a single player developer. And by the way, there's a load of single player developers out there that have exceptional talent, but they have no voice. And Steam, I love Steam, but they take a 30% cut. You know, it's kind of depressing, <laughs> you know. So I want to show love to my fellow developers because I know how it feels to lose 30% of my cut over like three years of work, you know, and it's not funny. So yeah, if that makes sense, that's how we really going to conglomerate developers together and really create a meaningful experience for our users and developers as a whole. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love it. I mean, I'm such a single player gamer myself that, you know, it, it, that has been a big lacking sort of like place in Web3. So it's really cool to hear of a strategy. Thank you to integrate that into the web three space. Jared, I saw you unmuted. So hop on in with your question, brother. Yeah, I really wanted to kind of go into, I know you guys are working on the AI implementation uh, and I really wanted to kind of bring that uh, into uh, the conversation as well. Kind of talk us through what your ideas <clears throat> were on that and you know how it's uh, helping out Creo Engine um, and the inter interoperability throughout uh, the whole thing. <laughs> Artificial intelligence is a monster. I think Mark Cuban made a made a post in the in the Good Morning America. He said that if you don't adopt AI, you will die, you will perish as a company. So primarily the first encounter with AI was, you know, how to make my employees work faster. Cause you know, they had to think of ideas, you know, they gotta think of, you know, workflows, you know, uh, information. Chat GPT was instrumental in getting people to work faster and iterate ideas faster in our in our studio which is phenomenal. And, you know, we were actually offered to utilize a program, which, you know, on our studio is kind of groundbreaking, where now you can make storyboards using AI, you could really speed up the whole artistic process when developing games, which, by the way, has been really helpful for our AAA studio game in India. They actually use AI to actually storyboard, you know, content quickly, which will save days in development time, right? When that happens, what AI does in game studios is increase output drastically. And that alone is a game changer in the creative industry. Now, frankly, of course, this means less wages because people could get job done faster and they won't, you know, they have to do more work for less. It's just it's just a mixed bag here when it comes to AI. But nonetheless, as a business owner, AI has been instrumental in increasing our output, increasing our output as a as a company. So in terms of what for Creo, 
we want to make sure that we create a system that handholds users, right? We want to create bots that actually tell people what these aspects on the platform are. What's the wallet? What's a token? And even to go as far as to create a machine that's smart enough that analyzes data, DAUs, MAUs, token prices, token fluctuations of all games that are integrated into our platform to tell individual users what games can you play? What's the ROI, right? This machine will be able to tell users what products are worth your time. That is a good value proposition for people who simply just want to make a living easily. We're trying to simplify the whole process. Now, a lot of companies are using AI because it's trendy, but we are trying to use it because it's efficient. Right? We're trying to use it for its because of its efficient. We want to make sure people have access to data immediately. Now, you can do a Google search and do your research, but they'll take hours. Why not just ask a question to a machine that's been trained on data every single day, right? It's important. It's extremely important. So another example of what we're trying to do is, you know, great. I had developers integrate into our platform our, our, through our proprietary developer toolkits. Now we asked them, hey, do you want to integrate with Celeste? This is basically our AI. Great. Celeste will take your data, your player input, right? Player activity every month and will make an analysis, right? And it'll even tell you, okay, how many users are cashing out? Why are they cashing out? All this becomes priceless information for developers who are making games. We can then sell that for a fee. Hey, you want to know what's how to make your game trendy? You want to know how to make money from your game? Use our AI. Tell us. Okay, uh, how to make an RPG effective in Web3 gaming? Great. Ask Celeste. Oh, you have to do this. You have to do that. So the machine can tell you what to do based on lifetime data. And all AI is essentially, Jared, is just the ability to sift through data and make data presentable and, well, conversational, right? Which has simplified the whole intelligence process. So, you know, Celeste as a whole is existing for that purpose, to handhold people, but also to make sure information activities are recorded, documented, and presented nicely, not just for users or developers, but for us as a company, because we can then ask the right questions. What do we do next? What do the people want? And then when we have DAOs, which is going to be a thing in platforms, a DAO could practically, you know, be a useful tool to give people a voice, right? And AI could go into a good mix with that. You know, imagine people, you know, asking machines what they could participate in, what they could do on the platform, how they could do it, and what's in it for them. Handholding people is the number one goal for Celeste. But yeah, that's just that's just the basic surface level of what we're trying to do, if that makes sense, Jared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And it, it seems like it sort of fits in with your concept of being the engine and the movement where, um, you know, I wanted to kind of also bring that part back to the unbanked and, you know, kind of talk about, you know, how that could be such a game changer for the unbanked and how they could come in and actually earn some of their financial freedom through that. And I think that's a really interesting and fascinating uh, part. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So, you know, can you imagine then, you know, hypothetically, there's some kid out there, you know, he spends like, you know, five bucks. He gets lucky, you know, with a game and he now makes, you know, a thousand, right? Maybe five hundred dollars. He could sell these assets or keep them as they appreciate in value. And what happens is that, you know, it just opens their eyes up. They play games, they get lucky, they make money. They play games, they dedicate to those games, they make money. And, you know, that becomes, should I say, an opportunity for many people in countries like India, Southeast Asia, right? Where Web3 gaming is a viable means to make income. Now a word from our sponsors. Introducing Creo Engine, a next level Web3 gaming ecosystem that connects gamers and developers in a Web3 gaming hub. Hop on their Creo Play platform to check out current and upcoming titles like Evermore Nights, Slime Haven, Creonia Metaverse, and Arcade Fest. The team has earned the endorsement of the Chairman of Indonesia's People Consultative Assembly and earned a 10 out of 10 from Hacken on their Cross Chain Bridge Audit. Check all this out and more on CreoEngine.com. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. Ah, back from Boom. the dead. Okay. We <laughs> are back. 
<laughs> now back to what I'm saying about artificial intelligence, right? It's it's a game changer because when information becomes re- readily accessible, you know, people will move faster. And what happens is that activity will increase, which is good for us as a platform, right? And, you know, we have this thing that we're making, which is kind of interesting. It's called Compute to Earn. So if you have a GPU on your PC that you want to try and contribute to Celeste, you could earn Creo. So Celeste does require a lot of computing power, which will cost a lot of money, but you can help us save money by, you know, using your GPUs, allocating power to that art of that machine, you know, to uh, we'll give you rewards for that in game materials and Creo or monetary rewards of the like. So, you know, that's something we're doing for people who are interested in using their GPUs for a greater purpose. And of course, in the end of the day, you are compensated and rewarded for that. So look forward to that. But, you know, artificial intelligence, it's a gold mine. But as long as it can fulfill its goal at making information accessible and making people, you know, access Creo play easily, then I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe now is a good opportunity. One thing audience is always hungry to know is sort of uh, tokenomics around uh, the native token. So could you give a deep dive on Creo, how it works in the ecosystem, sure. tokenomics and such? You know, Creo as a whole, if you think of a token, you have to think of it as a fundamental foundation for a platform, right? A lot of people that do Web3 businesses always say, I want to create a token. And I always ask them this question, does your project really need a token? You could just use USDT or, or fiat for subscriptions. The primary reason why we want to use a token is simple. We want to develop a reliance of users on the token. So users have to rely on our token to move around the platform. Transactions, minting. You know, even paying fees or subscriptions, even paying for your rewards, right? Yields. You know, if you're a Creo Play holder, if you're a Creo Play ID user and you are active in the platform, you might get percentage yields of the revenue for the company, which will be rewarded in Creo. So developing a reliance to Creo, if you're a user, is essential because, first of all, you know, it's good for us as a company. We could just use USDT, but, you know, frankly, using a token just logistically seems a lot more sound because it not only attracts users to the platform, but if you hold Creo, if you hold Creo, you're entitled to programs and benefits and in-game goods, right? For various games that we're partnered with. So essentially giving people incentives to hold the token is one thing, but really just making it easy to partner with the developers is another thing entirely. Because, you know, if you have your own token, you can do things like staking, DeFi's, and it just makes the whole process easier. So we need our token. Frankly, it's required, you know, to keep the platform afloat and frankly, to keep developers interested, right? But Frank, uh, but unfortunately, Nick and Jared, as, as I hate to say it, a lot of projects do use tokens just as a, a material to hype the project. But, you know, don't get me wrong. All projects do it. It's not a sin. It's a, it's a great thing. But you have to have a good business plan to keep it afloat, right? You got to make sure that whatever you're putting out there does work well. You don't just, you know, mess around with it and just use it and, you know, leave. So you have to make sure that when people use the platform, the Creo is heavily relied upon, if that makes sense. So, yes, a good chunk of the token, should I say, you know, parts of it goes to marketing. That's normal. But a good chunk of it actually is used on the platform itself and its functions and its partnerships and, you know, its individual games. There are some games that are currently using Creo only. But eventually those games will have their own tokens and they can do some fancy stuff with their tokens and Creo and you know, make some really interesting programs. But yeah, hopefully that helps shed light on our token. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we dive into the staking a little bit. Uh, is that currently out? Is that a future release? Where do you guys find uh, so, staking is going to work in the ecosystem? In about one and a half months, we'll have our DeFi.CreoPlay.app coming out. And then you could stake Creo to earn some very nice in-game rewards and token rewards from our very, very close partners. What's going to happen is, you know, as our game grows and as more games come on board the platform, we will actually begin, you know, actively pursuing developers to say, hey, do you want to partner up with us? You know, if you stay, if you hold Creo, you can earn your tokens, in-game materials. We want to make sure that when people hold Creo as a whole, they, do, they don't just earn tokens, but they earn in game goods, which can help elevate their experience, because who doesn't like free stuff? If you if you think about it, okay, I buy Creo, I hold it, I get some stuff, maybe like a couple cents, maybe two dollars, but I also get some in game goodies. I love free stuff. I love validation. 
the staking platform will be gamified. It's going to be gamified. We have to gamify everything. The whole point of Web3 and finance and gaming is, is to gamify it. You don't just hold Creo to get money, but you get in-game goods, which will increase your validation in playing games, which will increase your participation, get traction. This whole thing ties together. So the users will be hooked. They'll say, that I'm going to buy Creo because I might get some nice rewards. And then you broadcast, hey, this user got $1,000. He got lucky. Oh, this user got a rare item. He got lucky. And that will make the token so speculative, so mysterious that people can't help but try. You know, there's a saying in this country, you know, why not? There's a whole attitude with the why not <laughs> movement in Indonesia. It's like, you know what? Why not? Yeah, why not? You know, why not? Why not buy a half a cent of Creo and half a dollar of Creo to stake? Why not hold a bit of Creo for in-game rewards? Why not? Why not register for our platform through your WhatsApp number, which is easy to do. It takes like third, three seconds to make, and you could use that ID to stake immediately, right? Why not transfer money from your local bank account to us and get Creo through a credit card? You know, we're making easy to use on and off wrapping systems. We're going to make it so accessible that people can't help but try the whole why not, right? Especially when you reward them pretty well in the gaming sense. If that makes sense, Nick. No, that makes a lot of sense. I also really like the idea of, obviously, we've seen the sort of overused model of you stake a token so that you can get more of those tokens. I think we've seen how that can could potentially have shortfalls, inflationary and such. So I like the model of stake tokens, get in-game assets, um, because there's not necessarily that same sort of inflationary problem, especially if you rotate sort of what games are getting in-game assets and such, or if those games or if those in-game assets happen to be, you know, a uh, single use, for instance. So I oh, yeah. really, really like the the model there. Um, I'd love to dive into one of the most unique things, in my opinion, about Creo, which is that stamp of approval from the Indonesian government <laughs> coming from the West. To even think about a crypto company getting a stamp of approval from the government is <laughs> requires oh, imagination. Yeah. So I would love to hear the story of how that came about, what the relationship is like, what are sort of the the like pros and cons or really the benefits that each party is getting out of this and such. Well, first of all, I have to be accountable. <laughs> you know, accountability. You know, my face is everywhere. So I have in my best interest to make this a successful company, right? It's my best interest to make it work. Die trying, right? Accountability is a big thing for me and I have to make it work. The government wants to support new technologies. They want to regulate it. They want to support it. They want to grow it. Why? Because they see opportunities for jobs in this industry. They want to grow the job market. So they see a gaming platform as an opportunity to make gaming a, well, a way of life. For a lot of people. And $20 goes a long way here. You know, your average meal is about $2, right? So $20 gets you a full meal for the entire week. And, you know, on average, people that play our game make about, about $10 to $30 a week, right? So, you know, it's it's going to work. And, you know, a lot of people who played our games early on make a, made quite a killing, actually, you know, made a good amount of money, you know, for, for practically nothing. So this is why when the government saw that, they 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 see the potential of, you know, a gaming company in the Web3 sense becoming secure, non-fraudulent because it's blockchain and it's manageable. And they see people utilizing blockchain as a way of life, as a way to make income, right? And we got the stamp of approval because we actually you know, applied to be legalized as a token. So now, now that we're legal as a token, as a commodity, people can have confidence in us to trade. And now, you know, with the new elected president and vice president, they're actually, you know, pro-crypto. This is the funny thing. The vice president of Indonesia, you know, is pro crypto and he wants to bring crypto to the limelight as a way to do, do good business. Frankly, right now in this entire country, the whole crypto movement is just emerging. We have kids who are just starting to get into crypto trading right now. We have kids who are just keen on learning about Web3 gaming and how you make money from there. Right. If they don't want to take the risk of trading, why not play some games, multiple games and make income? Right. Start from there. We want to provide that tool, that value for these young people across Indonesia. And the government sees that and be like, great. You know, we could definitely help you guys get across to these people. And we could definitely put a stamp for approval and get pe get people to, you know, to feel reassured by your business. Right. 
And we want them to be essentially, should I say, a voice where they'll tell people that, hey, Creo Engine is a company. We back them up. It's good. And, you know, we hope that you guys could you know, benefit from it. Right. We hope you guys could use it well. Right. Now, granted, we have to follow some rules. Right. We cannot. I have to be accountable, right? I cannot do anything suspicious. I can't do anything, you know, I have to do everything transparently, right? A lot of projects, they don't do that. They, you know, hide behind corners. But we, since now the government is with us, they want us to be accountable and it's a given, right? And we have to do it, right? Because if this works and we could tap into 200 million people across the country and, you know, this will be a good case study. And better yet, when that happens, you could imagine how many developers come to us to get a piece of the pie, which again, will grow the entire platform. So this whole thing is tied together ultimately in the end. Mm. Did, did the government have any input on any um, mechanisms, burning mechanisms, the token, or was it more just like an application and, you know, follow these guidelines and you're good. They to go? essentially want us to do two things, Jared. They want us to make sure, first of all, to be accountable, right. To make sure that the token burns, you know, um, basically a token circulation is viable. It's reasonable. And you're not actually, uh, you know, exploiting users on the platform, which is what they, they don't want, right? Because it's a Muslim country. You cannot do that. It's it's haram practically to do that to users, right? So that's one. But the other thing is this. They want to create a platform for games because local game developers across the country, they're just, they want to find a platform to expose their products to. This is why I stress the single player approach to, you know, the platform. So the government not only just wants us to create a platform where crypto is involved, they want to actually create a platform where local developers could find business, you know, using Web3 technologies, which is part of their creative economy initiative, right? To really become and support the gaming industry in Indonesia wholeheartedly, like Korea is. Because right now, the gaming industry in this country is just getting started. They're actually doing a large grant of a billion dollars to give out to studios, right? So what's going to happen is that with this $1 billion, you're going to push the game industry to greater heights, right? And I actually met with the vice minister of, you know, the creative economy, Angela, a great, great lady. She's smart. I told her exactly. She asked me this question, Daryl, how do we make great game studios? How do you get great talents in Indonesia? And I told them we have to assimilate. We have foreign developers on our platform making high quality games. Why not assimilate users, assimilate developers in one platform? Why not get single player games of good quality from local developers to be on our platform, to be critiqued by communities outside of the local market and to have them do business with web three technologies, which I think is a brand new approach to things because steam is flooded with games from everywhere, but why not create a platform fresh out the fresh out the woodwork, get local developers on board and have them, you know, interact with, you know, the features, the systems in a web three sense. That's a good way to, to expose developers to a web three audience at the very least. So that initiative is good enough to actually support their, you know, their their prerogative as a government to really create or really cultivate their creative economy in Indonesia, if that helps. Yeah. And while we're on the topic, I think it'd be interesting for the audience um, to maybe highlight some of the differentiators between sort of Western gamers and Southeast Asian gamers. What are some of the big sort of differences between those different demographics of gamers? Well, if, if one thing's for sure, Southeast Asians are consumers. They love consuming things. If you go to if you go to a restaurant, you know, we're not picky. That's the word. We're not picky. We consume, we enjoy, we find ways to benefit from it. But we are massive. We have a lot of people. The consuming power is massive, right? Quantity is a name of the game here. Right? A lot of people consume products every day. They want ways to benefit from these products every day, right? And they're indifferent when it comes to, you know, ethics, right? Like, oh, it's Web3. Oh, it's Web2. It's made by this, made by that. They don't care. All they care about is, do I like it? Do I not like it? Can I make money from it? Can I lose money from it? They got to know these things. It's pretty straightforward. Very blunt, you know, if you think about it. The Western audience, however, is different. You know, they're, they're very... Now, America is a great country. Don't get me wrong. It's a fantastic country. I went there myself for four years. I studied accounting there. Great place. Food's fantastic. People are intelligent. They're smart. They're they're fast. But the Americans have a very peculiar way of thinking, which, you know, which maybe you could maybe you could agree with me or not, Nick, but they're very sensitive towards topics, ideals, perspectives, which could really be a a divider in terms of what products they consume 
what products they back. So you can actually have people who support an ideal and they'll buy anything for that ideal. They'll do anything to support the ideal, which is unfortunate. You know, I mean, America, great country, strong country, best in the world in military and, you know, education, right? And the people are so divided. And, you know, I went to America and I think, why are you guys so divided? You have a great country, you know, amazing stuff, but you're divided amongst yourself. That division is what, you know, people, and this is why marketing agencies have a hard time figuring out ad targeting ads, you know, and they, it's, it's an art form, right? So the the good part is when you're a marketing agency in America, you can target people specifically because of those division, those ideals, and you have an easier time as a marketing agency, but in this country, oh my God, everybody likes the same thing. So what do I do? So it's like, this is why, this is why, you know, that's the differentiating factor between Americans and the Indonesians or Southeast Asians in general, right? Which is nothing wrong. America, you know, it's it's a different breed of people and different way of thinking. You know, I grew up in both countries, so I, I know both perspectives. I've used it to my advantage as a business owner. So, you know, yeah, different people. But nonetheless, we all have the same blood and the same hearts. So, you know, I wish for peace. <laughs> yes. I was wondering if we could talk about some of the actual games that are inside of Creo Play um, and some of the ones that are, you know, in-house, but also some that came in after uh, and which ones are, you know, kind of the most hyped that are about to come out. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Evermore Nights and Slime Haven, those are two in-house games. Slime Haven, that game, a lot of esport organizations in our country you know, we're well connected to them. They want to try and onboard a cutesy strategic, you know, PvP based game, a win to earn game. And that game is lightweight on all mobile devices and it's cute and it's straightforward. You could have a very fun time playing the game, you know, trying to beat your friends out there and really uh, see if it's, should I say, acceptable for that particular audience in Southeast Asia, right? We were trying to get that out there with some of the esport organizations that we know very well, right? And that's one. Another one that's, you know, also hyped up, that's also very cool. It's a game called Animera, which I mentioned earlier. That game, if you look at it, it's a space shooter game, high quality AAA. We have 15,000 pre-beta users on that game right now that are playing the game. And we're revamping the game, making it, you know, high quality, not just for Web2 users, but for Web2 users in general, trying to get the Web2 audiences to play the game, enjoy it, and actually start buying things in that game as a fun, you know, PvP game. We actually notice the trend as a company is that if you make competitive games that are enjoyable, that's the best games to market because that will create rivalry, competition between people. Evermore Nights is more of an RPG game with story. So a lot of people we attracted are single player players that build characters, theory craft, and actually buy packages to boost up your characters. But in the end, all the games on our platform, at least the ones that we are incubating personally, have the competitive element to it. Because again, the number one thing for any game, Jared, is, you know, validation. Every game is a validation tool. Competitive games are the best validators in the world. So those are the games that we're trying to bring out there because we want to attract people to compete and to earn and to actually, you know, we're going to do large cash term and prizes, which will, of course, then create a positive feedback loop where people could buy assets to try and win those prizes and to, you know, show off to their friends. Right. We want to create those validation pushers, right, to ensure that people not only play the game, but they actually, you know, buy stuff in the game and, you know, could benefit them in their competitions, their, you know, events and to really create a strong community that really not just plays the game for the money, which, by the way, those communities are not loyal to you, but they want to play the game for fun. Right. More than anything. So, yeah, check those out. Slime Haven, Evermore Nights and Annie Mara. Those are games that we're really trying to push out out there in the next quarter or so. Yeah, absolutely. And and diving back into sort of some of the differences between sort of the East and the West, what are some of the big catalysts that people are excited about in Asia around either just crypto gaming or crypto in general? In the West, at least myself, very election focused. Um, in the United States being a big sort of like catalyst for like crypto. Oh, yeah. Obviously, the ETH ETF is one of those big sort of like hot button things. So what are some of the catalysts that people are focused on in Asia if they are focused on catalysts? I think if you look, let's talk about America first. So America, you know, I think Trump made a statement being pro crypto. That That's like a wow. You know, it's amazing. And he got convicted for being a felon. You know, it's, I don't know what happened. <laughs> it is what it is. But, you know, in Asia... 
a we're not looking for catalyst per se. In Asia, it's more like, how could this benefit my day to day? Right. So a platform like ours with games that are well established that could benefit people once mainstream could be a catalyst because we're going to do a lot of educational content behind our platform. People, influencers will say that, hey, did you know you can make 20 bucks a week playing these games? Did you know you can make $50 a week playing these games? And now you can do a broadcast of testimony based marketing saying some kid out there made 500 bucks selling an NFT of a sword or of a car. I don't know. Right. When that happens, a lot of people will jump on it to try and take advantage of it. And that's when we as a platform could really not only be used widely and not only will Creo be widely used across the platform, but, you know, you could imagine ramifications, right? You know, the virality of it could be astounding, right? So it all takes just a proven business model of a useful platform to really get people to jump on board and to use it widespread right which if that happens you know then word of mouth will do its job right you can have the best marketing teams but if you're not useful then you know you're, you're dead in the water this is why it all takes just a couple months of people saying that hey this is useful i like it and that happens it will all come and unravel if that makes sense that does make sense uh one sort of maybe interesting area to explore. One thing I'm curious about is, is there meme fever in Indonesia or Asia in, uh, in Asia abroad? Like currently in the West, we have an absolute frothiness around memes and Doge and Dog and Pepe and Bonk. Is that a Western phenomenon or is that an international phenomenon? That's an international phenomenon. I actually bought, bought Slurf. Now, if you heard of Slurf, right? I think those guys had a very interesting run. There were a crap load of Chinese buyers in the Telegram chat, and Indonesian buyers. The bulk of the Telegram users were Indonesian and Chinese. So the Southeast Asian markets are very much receptive to meme tokens. This is why one of our games that we're incubating is called Meme Lords. That game is designed to really onboard and interoperate with meme tokens across any chain. It's a chain agnostic game, the first of its kind, which is unheard of, you know, a chain agnostic game onboarding memes across the industries into one platform for, you know, trading, battling. We see memes as assets because they're speculators. If you create a project on pure speculation, people will trade and gamble with it, right? So meme tokens will never die because it's just a gambling object. It goes up and down and you move between meme tokens to catch the wave and, you know, take money from other people. So now you have all these meme tokens lined up in exchangers and now you're making a gamble. What's going to go up? What's going to go down? How do I ride this wave and make the most out of it through what transactions, what coins? So the meme market is very much the number one thing. Well, should I say the number one thing to actually do in crypto? And it just so happens as a, as a game platform, we're trying to make a meme game, meme lords, a thing. Because when that becomes a thing, you know, now that game will be the center of speculation, you know, because the game, this is a side note, but that game has what you call lords, which are based on meme tokens. So the amount of holders that, that, that the lords has, the amount of holders and trading volume, the stronger the character will be in game. That is enough for speculation especially when you put cash prizes, you know, events. So the whole point of memes is to really create as much speculation as possible to get users riled up and to get them to trade, right? And that, my friends, is the beauty of crypto because people just won't stop, you know, trying to do much more. But yeah, that's my answer to the question, if that helps. No, that definitely helps and super funny. I mean, it makes sense that memes would be international because, you know, you're not constrained by AMAs in certain languages and white papers and, you know, the leadership teams. It's just purely picture based. It's like pictographs. Speculation. Exactly. Yeah. Speculation over image. Uh, Jared, I didn't mean to cut you off. Do you have something there? No, I just wanted to talk about uh, Katana Inu, which I think uh, came out, the token itself came out years ago, and now they have a, um, a game coming out on your platform. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. I mean, that seems like a, a meme oh, yeah. <laughs> token. You know, this is a bit of spill, but we're trying to actually integrate our career play ID to Katana Inu to get people 
on our network to log into Katana Inu quickly, right? And they're actually making a mascot for our platform, you know, for, as an NFT. So that's going to be really cool because they have really killer Unreal designers there. And I'm happy to work with them. Marwan, if you're listening to this, thank you, man, for helping us with the designs. I love it. So, you know, can't wait for that to happen. Honestly, I'm very happy with uh, with what, what we've done so far with them. They're a great oh, yeah. team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's an exciting project that's coming through. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, Creo can get to be a part of that as well. So uh, oh, yeah. I love how you guys are integrating your token along with other tokens as well. I, I like that uh, synergy that you have there. Thank you. Yeah, I'm definitely bullish on games that incorporate memes. Like the more I think about it, the more it like seems like a no brainer. Um, <laughs> just because of how divisive the meme culture is and like, you know, oh, like fuck your cat. Like really the dog, it's the dogs like this cycle. No, it's the cats. No, it's the frogs. Like having a opportunity for people to be able to battle that out and either, you know, sort of something like you were describing in Lords or Katana Inu. I'm imagining like meme combat one of just like a Mortal oh, Kombat yeah. ripoff with just memes. I mean, you got to imagine that would absolutely crush. Oh yeah, yeah. In the end, you know, I love memes. I think I grew up with memes. I grew up with Nine Gag. If you know what Nine Gag is, it's a great platform before TikTok came along. So, you know, we're trying to make sure that memes become a thing, but not just, you know, as a speculation, but for entertainment purposes too, which is a big thing because we want to make people entertain them as best as possible through, you know, um, fun combat, fun UI, fun UX interfaces, you know, making a fun game based on memes, entirely on memes. So hopefully that will come to light and you guys will enjoy it. Absolutely. Daryl, we're getting pretty close to the top of the hour. I know it's late in Indonesia. No so problem. Be very respectful of your time, but want to pass the mic back. Hey, was there anything that any topic we didn't get a chance to dive into? Any questions you were hoping well, we weren't going to ask that we didn't? No, I'm good. I'm good. You know, I just want to say before, before we end the call is that, you know, uh, thank you for giving me time to you know spread the word, spread the gospel <laughs> of, our, of our platform. And, you know, I hope that to anyone listening to this, that you consider us, you know, because we're trying to make big strides in the gaming space in Indonesia and beyond. And you know, we can't wait to prove it to you guys that we're actually a business that could work. And, you know, we've seen businesses succeed before, like we mixed, you know, that made $200 million in the last bear market. We want to be like them. We want to be bigger than them, hopefully. Amen. Right. So I want to be a force of change, or should I say an engine of change? And, you know, this is Daryl from Creo Engine. I'm happy to be here. And thank you for having me, Nick and Jared. Absolute pleasure. Thank you again for not only joining us, but also for sponsoring the podcast. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, no problem. And I, and I know I'm super excited to see how you guys grow. Jared, anything left on your end? No, thank you so much, uh, Daryl. It was a pleasure having you. And, uh, you know, we look Likewise. forward to everything you guys are doing. I'm uh, really excited about it. All right. No problem. Good to see you guys. Absolutely. Thanks. Always a pleasure to co-host with you, Jared. And this has been an episode of Neo Tokyo's official podcast, Interlinked. And we will be back with future episodes next week. Take care, everybody.